Okay. This session is um, being recorded and is 75 minutes in length, which includes a 15 minute question and answer period. However, um, Mr. Hunter has um, allowed us to be able to keep our microphones available. We want you to keep them muted, but you um, might be asked to open those up throughout the presentation and you can drop questions for Michael Hunter into the chat and we will address those throughout the presentation as they come up. To access closed captioning, click on the icon CC Live Transcript on the Zoom control panel. And if you do experience technology difficulties, please go to the technical support guides area above the schedule on the symposium page. At this time, we will ask you to keep your video feature turned off and stay muted um, unless, again, our presenter asks us to unmute and participate. We would love for you to tweet out or share out on social media all that you are learning from the Literacy Symposium. The hashtag for the symposium is hashtag patentlit2022. And now it's my honor and my pleasure to introduce you to Michael Hunter. Good morning, welcome. So excited to be here. And um, let's just get started with our session because I've got a lot I would love to share. So um, let me just make sure everything's working here. There we go. Okay, first thing I want to tell you is if you have access to uh, the, if you've been able to get access to the handouts, we have a system that we use in our handouts where the, if the title on the slide up here is red, that slide, that particular slide will not be in the handouts and that's on purpose. So don't freak out if you can't find it. Um, and if it has a purple title, it should be in the handout packet. Um, so let's get started. We have three objectives this morning. One is I wanna to demonstrate to you an effective way to introduce words before you actually teach the definition. So I know that all of you are experienced with teaching definitions and have a lot of vocabulary routines, but we have a, uh, an interesting way of first introducing the word to create hooks for students to hang that meaning that you're gonna to give uh, to them on. And then we're gonna talk about uh, student-created definitions, which is a follow-up to after you've taught a word. And then finally, uh, we're just gonna share a clever way that some teachers showed us to an innovative way to reinforce those words that students seem to be having trouble uh, hanging on to and, and acquiring the meaning for. So um, just to, to be upfront and honest about where we're going, the focus of this workshop is uh, on ideas for beginning vocabulary instruction and for ending vocabulary instruction. So that middle part where we teach the word, um, there's a lot of, I, I know that all of you have ways to do that and there's a lot of stuff out there that, that can uh, be accessed. And so we wanna share some, some unusual stuff that we've come across and worked with to do that beginning and ending piece to wrap up uh, once we've taught the word. Um, so we're not gonna focus on how to actually teach the word except for one caveat. We uh, are very emphatic about you provide the meaning to the students once you've uh, done this introduction we're gonna show you and that you don't ask students to come up with a meaning for a word. They will explore the meaning of the word as you're learning, as they're learning and you're teaching the word, but you will be the initial um, thing. Okay, I, there's a note in the chat about something about enlarging the screen. Can you guys see the, the slide screen? Because that's what I want you to be able to see. We can see the slides. Okay, I believe it's great. in the view setting. Mm -hmm. We can okay. see it. Good. Just wanted to make sure. Um, okay. So there are four steps that we use to introduce uh, a word when we're going to teach a word, or actually to teach a word, excuse me, not just to introduce. So the, this is what we're going to go through first this morning. Step one is uh, pronunciation. Step two is spelling. And these are the new steps that I want to introduce you to this morning. Step three is meaning, and that's to provide and teach the meaning. And that's the part that I think you guys probably have experience for, with. And step four is going to be our class developed student created definitions. And this is kind of a synthesis, a wrap up to, to let you assess, have the students actually secured meaning for the word and uh, to help them further refine and, and develop their understanding of the word. 
Okay, so these are the steps we do in step one. I'm gonna teach you these in just a moment to demonstrate, but we first show the word in print and we say the word for the students. Then we're gonna step away from the print for a moment and have the students focus on the sounds of the word. Make sure that they can pronounce the word accurately, that they uh, tune into the actual sound of the word, the pronunciation of the word. And once we've walked through that, I'm gonna walk you through the steps that we use. Uh, then we're gonna go back to the print and have the students connect that sound that they've just uh, explored, the pronunciation of the word and the sounds of the word to the print. So that they're getting a connection between how the word is said, how the word looks or is spelled. Um, and we'll walk through those steps for you. So you have these in the handouts, these steps, so you'll be able to refer back to them as we go through. Step three, we're going to uh, provide, excuse me, I gotta move something on my screen here because I can't see. <laughs> I wanna make sure I'm telling you what's there. Uh, and it won't move. Okay, well, we'll just work around it. Okay, so we're going to uh, provide the words meaning and teach the lesson. And this is the part that, as I said, I know you all are already doing and have lots of um, ways to teach. And if we had more time and this were a little easier to do interaction, I would uh, have actually started with getting you guys to share some of the, uh, the ways that you do this. But um, things like pictures and definitely looking at words in context, uh, exploring the word in the context that you're teaching from, um, and then also discussing any morphology for the word, so the roots, the affixes, uh, and then um, ways to practice and study the word. Um, and I, again, this is not what our focus for this morning is. It's this uh, getting started with the word and then finishing with the word is what we're going to work on. So the fourth step is gonna be a new step. And that is to have the students work together to create their own definition for the word after they've learned the word, after they've explored the word and you've done all that teaching of the word. This is kind of a wrap up activity for them to demonstrate to you that they have learned the word, that they've uh, synthesized the meaning of it. And it will actually, the activity itself will help them sort of organize and, uh, you know, it will allow you to see any con confusions that may have occurred. Um, so it's a way to kind of wrap up the definition learning process. Um, and you may want to use graphic organizers with that, but we're going to give you a template for how to do that. Uh, and that's part of what we'll explore this morning. So before we get started, uh, what ages do we want to do this process with? Um, Middle of second grade through high school, you would do the entire procedure that uh, I've just briefly outlined and that we're going to walk through in a moment. In kindergarten, you will still show the word in print, um, but you're not going to teach the spelling of the word unless it's a word that, that students already have been exposed to in phonics, the, the concept, the phonics concepts, the spelling concepts, because they're not ready to learn to spell a word, even though we can, they can learn the definition. If they're just learning how to begin you know to decode and to spell words they're probably not going to be ready to spell all the words that you want them to start acquiring in vocabulary um, this is not a spelling lesson this is going to just be an introduction this introduction to the word before getting to the meaning is uh is a vocabulary component and you if you really want the students to be able to spell the word you will also need to uh, put it into your spelling instruction um, but they will have a good solid introduction to it and be ready to learn how to spell it. Um, oops, okay. Uh, any questions at this point before we start in? And I'm, I'm please ask questions if you have them. I don't see any in the chat, but if anybody has questions, feel free to yeah. open your mic and ask a question or to drop one in. Oh, how does this work with English learners? Um, it will work the same in, in that um, they have to learn the definition. If you can link it to, uh, you know, what they, uh, uh, the definition they may know in their own language. I don't know if you know, you know, enough about your English language learner's language. Uh, I would not know how to do that. But um, 
pictures, uh, of course, and this this is all part of good vocabulary instruction. I find that with uh, personally with English language learners, that what I think is good teaching is the same thing that we're going to do with English language learners, just ramp it up a little bit more with being aware of where they might be confused, where you can bring in extra supports like pictures and tying into what you may know about uh, what they already know about language. It, you cannot teach anyone the meaning of a new word unless you can provide a definition using words they already know the meaning of. This is one of the problems with the dictionary is in the dictionary, you often uh, encounter, you look up a word and you find out, well, you don't really know the words that are they're giving you in the dictionary that are the definition for the word you're looking up. So you have to look those up and you know, it becomes a little rabbit hole chase. Um, you, students have to have vocabulary uh, that can support the meaning for the word that you're teaching. And that's what you're gonna use to teach with. Um, so if they don't have the lower level vocabulary that you're using in your definition, um, that will be a problem with ELL and you're gonna have to you know, work on teaching that level in order to help them get to the higher level word, if that makes any sense. Um, let's, thank you for the question. Excellent question. Uh, any others? One more question we... just came in. Sure. Like that now? Yeah. My students are used to the teacher providing the definitions since kindergarten. So what do I ask to get them to develop their own definition? We're gonna cover that. We're gonna give you templates to do that with. And remember, you're only gonna ask them to give their own definition after you've taught the word. So you'll have provided the definition, you'll have explored the meaning of the word through your normal instruction, um, you know, in context, uh, if, if appropriate, examples and non-examples, those sort of things, uh, synonyms, antonyms, all of that. Um, the, but we'll give you a template here in, later this morning in this session for how to teach the students how to process and create their own definitions. So hang tight for that. Any more? Okay, let's uh, talk about, there is a research base for connecting the spelling and pronunciation. And this was uh, a, a study done by Linnea Airy and Rosenthal in 2007. And they did a study where they compared higher and lower readers for memory of the pronunciations of words first without showing the spelling. So they dictated some words or pronounced some words for some students, uh, the two groups, they had a group of higher uh, readers and then some uh, lower readers separately. They pronounced the words, gave the words, and then they asked the students, uh, they did a recall assessment to see how many of the words the students could recall having just heard the word. They didn't, this was not about vocabulary uh, instruction. This was just how, how do they do with uh, remembering the word having just heard it? And what they found was there was little difference uh, on memory for pronunciation. So both groups had the same rate of return on the number of words that they could remember. Then in contrast to that, they did a comparison of the same reader groups on their memory for retrieving the word or remembering the word when they just showed the spelling along with pronouncing the word. They didn't go over the spelling, they just put the word up in print uh, and then gave the pronunciation for the word. They did a short list of words and then they asked the students to, you know, recall the words that they had just uh, been shown and heard. And what they found was there's this huge difference uh, in memory between the higher and lower group. And the higher group, of course, was the one that had a better uh, re re rate of return on the number of words that they could remember after just seeing the word in print along with getting the pronunciation. And the reason for that would be that they are able, the, higher readers are able to use the print, just seeing the print, when they hear the pronunciation, they automatically start doing the orthographic mapping. They map the pronunciation to the spelling because the spellings are familiar to them and they don't, you know, they're able to decode so that they can also encode. So what the, they came out from the study was, was that they proposed that this showing the word along with the, so the print along with the uh, pronunciation forms an amalgam along with provide then when you provide the meaning 
it gives the student all these connections in their brain um, that we now also, if you know of orthographic mapping, is the way that we retain new words in print once we've figured out how to pronounce them and know the meaning. We cement all these three things together, the spelling, the pronunciation, and the meaning in our brain, and that becomes our sight words, uh, not the high frequency words, but our sight words, the words that we don't have to sound out every time we come across, across them. So they say that the researchers say that this amalgam uh, in memory of the spelling, the pronunciation, the meaning gets cemented together. They kind of glue together um, and that supports holding both the spelling, the pronunciation and the meaning in the brain. So we're creating uh, all these little, I think of them as hooks or ties together that hook all those pieces together and they support each other, which is why we want to use our process to introduce a word. So um, I don't know how many people know the word amalgam, but I think it's a fun word to teach. So I'm going to use that as our example to teach. And uh, again, I'm trying to move something. There we go, get that out of the way on my screen so that I can have the screen in front of me. Okay, so we're going to, I'm gonna go through all four steps that I had laid out briefly earlier and um, you will be my students. And, um, I think what I'm going to ask is, could I have um, five volunteers who will unmute? I mean, unmute. Uh, and if you want, you can turn on your video. I don't have to see you, but um, and I would like to be able to call on you as my students. Uh, you can always, whenever I call on anyone, you can pass. But since I'm asking for volunteers, I'm hoping you won't do that but uh, all my students can always pass. But if I could have five volunteers, um, just unmute right now and tell me your name so I can write it down so I can call on you. Shelly. Shelly, okay, that's one. Catherine. Catherine. Okay, there may be more than one Catherine here. So why don't I get a final initial? So Shelly, what, uh, what's your last, uh, what's your initial of your last name? B. As in boy. Shelly B. Catherine. B as in dog. Okay, got BD going on. All right. Uh, number three. Lisa. Lisa. And then I think I heard Heidi. Okay. Eileen. Eileen. Not Heidi. Mm -hmm. Oh, not Heidi. Sorry. Yes. And I need one more, please. Sister Tiara. Okay, I, uh, I heard two names there. I'll take both of them, Hillary and who else? Marie. Marie, okay, great. Um, all of you that are not my volunteers, feel free to answer the questions. Just don't unmute um, and play along with us. But uh, this way I have some names I can call on just so that I can model how I would do this with an actual class. Okay, so we're gonna step one, we're gonna cement the phonological aspects of the word in our volunteers' minds and the rest of your minds. Uh, step two, we're gonna go back to print and tie that pronunciation to the spelling. Step three, I am going to teach you the, provide and teach you the meaning of the word. And then step four, we'll develop a student created definition for the word, and that'll be your ex first exposure to the template. And then we'll do some more work with the templates for that. So uh, let's get started. Um, okay. Guys, we're gonna learn a new word today. Here it is on the board. This word is amalgam. Would everyone say amalgam? Amalgam. amalgam. Okay, great. Uh, Marie, say the word, please. Amalgam. Hillary, say the word. Okay, Shelley, say the word. Amalgam. Catherine. Amalgam. Okay, everybody, what's the word? No. Okay, now um, we're going to focus on the meaning of the word here. I mean, the sound of the word here. How many syllables do you hear in that word? And when I say show, you can hold up your fingers so I can see what everybody's thinking. Um, how many syllables do you hear in the word amalgam? Show. Three. Oh, sorry. Well, you can say it, but. Um, See, if I ask you to wait and then do show, I can see what everybody's thinking, even if you're kind of copying your neighbor, but okay. Now, if your students um, 
are not familiar with trying to think about how many syllables are in a word, um, there is a simple way to get them to understand what a syllable is. And I, I'm just going to introduce that to you right now. It's something we call whale talk because um, that's what one of the students that we used it with uh, called it. Um, and whale talk works like this. I'm going to say our word amalgam. I'm going to say it just aloud. And then I'm going to squeeze my lips together or hold my lips together so that I cannot open my mouth. And I'm going to shout that word amalgam. So watch. Amalgam. Try it, yes. Okay. How many sounds did you hear or how many pushes of breath did you feel in your mouth? And that's how many syllables are in a word. The way this works is that when you keep your lips tight together and shout the word, you are eliminating all the consonant sounds and what's left are the vowel sounds trying to get out. And those are those pushes and sounds you uh -huh. hear. And that's a syllable. A syllable is a unit of speech sound organized around a vowel sound. And this is the fastest, quickest way to get students to feel and hear the number of syllables in a word. And then it's easy to go from there to what are the actual syllables. Um, so we had three syllables. We felt three pushes. Um, so now that we've uh, figured out that there are three, we do a thing that we call stomping and we take our fist and we go from left to right as we say each of the syllables. So we go, uh, mal, gum. Everybody? Uh, mal, gum. And then of course we sweep the word back together. Mal. Left to right, amalgam. So we have segmented the syllables and put them back together. Okay. Now that we've done that, um, I can ask, let's see, uh, Lisa, what was the first syllable in amalgam? Ah. Uh. Okay. Uh, what was the second syllable, Marie? Mal. 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 Okay. Mal. And what was the third syllable, um, Eileen? Did we lose Eileen? Okay, Shelley, what was the third syllable? Gum. Okay. Um, Let's see, uh, Catherine, what was the middle syllable? Mal. What was the uh, first syllable, Marie? Ah. Uh. And Eileen, what was the uh, last syllable? Okay, we still have lost, I think. Okay, um, so I'm having you, I'm, I'm gonna step out and be, talk to you guys as teachers now. What I did there was just, you know, have you guys randomly think about the syllables in order and out of order so that you, I know that you have a firm grip on each of those syllables. It can be, you know, it's a little hard on Zoom to do this as quick paced as I would like to be able to do it. But um, I think you're getting the feel. And, you know, once everybody knew the routine, it would go even faster. So we're going to finish with everybody, let's say the syllables in order as I uh, touch the line. Uh, L, 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 um, um. Okay. So now that we have um, thought about the sounds in the word. We're now gonna connect this spelling. So we're gonna go back to the spelling. And um, let me start with uh, Hillary. Is Hillary there? Nope, lost Hillary. Okay. Um, Catherine, yes. what, was the, what was the first syllable in amalgam? Uh. Okay. And looking at the word, how do, you, how do we spell uh? With an A. Okay. Whoops, I got ahead of myself here. Yes, with an A. Okay. Um, Shelly, what's the middle syllable? Mal. And how do we spell it? And M A L. Whoops. You got it. And uh, Marie, what's the last syllable? Gum. And how do we spell it? G A M. Okay. So you guys just spelled amalgam. And notice I didn't have you guess how to spell it. I had you look at the word and tell me how to spell it. So I'm showing you how we spell this word um, so that you have uh, done it. And we've matched now the spelling to the pronunciation. And if I want you guys to own the spelling of this word, I'll go a little bit further and I'll have you uh, look at the word and notice anything that seems unusual in the spelling 
and the first syllable mm -hmm. is the letter A, but it's not pronounced as A ah or A, it's a schwa. So we can mark that as a schwa. We're going to have to memorize that the first syllable in amalgam doesn't sound like A or A, ah, it's a schwa sound A. Uh, so we're going to remember that A spells the first syllable in amalgam, the schwa sound. Mal spells itself. If I were to ask you to sound out Mal and spell Mal, you would go M-A-L. That would be an expected spelling. But gum, we have another schwa mm -hmm. spelling the uh sound. The A spells the uh sound. So what's interesting about this word though, guys, notice what is the vowel letter in each syllable? A. 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 So that will help us remember how to spell this word because all of the vowels in amalgam whether they're schwa or the short A are spelled with the letter A. So that makes this word a little bit easier to spell than it might look like originally. Okay, so everybody take a look at our word and think about the spelling of each syllable. And, whoops, I'm going to take away our word and we're going to think about what we just looked at. And Shelley, what was the last syllable in amalgam? Gum. And how did we spell it? G-A-M. OK. Um, Marie, what was the first syllable? Ah. And how did we spell it? A. And Catherine, what was the middle syllable? Mal. And how did we spell it? M-A-L. OK. Um, who else do I have here? Lisa, are you there? No, nope. yes, I'm here. Oh, okay. Lisa, can you spell the whole word for us? A M A L E A M. Okay, everybody, spell the whole word. A M A L G A M. Okay. So now we have connected the pronunciation of the word with the spelling of the word. And you can spend more time on this if it's a more difficult word to pronounce. You can spend a little more time on step one, making sure that everybody has the pronunciation solid. So if the word was immunization, which is tricky to say, um, I think for most students, you would spend a little more time on making sure that we get immunization, immunization, get that um, sound tightened down. And then for um, the spelling, if the spelling has got more complexities to it, you can spend a little longer on rehearsing the spelling of it. Again, we're not teaching the spelling, but this is the first step in the students owning the spelling. And they will, a lot of your students will be able to spell this word after just that much uh, work with it. <coughs> okay. So, um, Michael, see. there were a few questions from this yeah, first couple of steps. Would you say, like those now? Yes, let's, okay. let's answer a question about those right now. Yep. The first one says, do we call on volunteers or just do choral from the start in step one? We do both. So um, the first thing we'll do is we'll, uh, I'll say the word, everyone will say the word. And then I call on at least three students um, to make sure that that everyone's getting the pronunciation. Because I find that if I call on three students individually, uh, if anybody's, I have a good chance of hitting somebody who might not have it. And then that would, I would spend more time given that somebody didn't quite have it. We're gonna do a little more rehearsal before we move on. If everybody seems to have it, then I can move on. Um, so that was a great question. Um, and then we'll go back to everybody says it one more time. So we start with choral. We do some individual turn and then we go wrap up with a quarrel. And we can do the same with the spelling. We can do, and one thing that I didn't model, but that's kind of fun to do, and maybe we can do it real quickly here. Uh, Maria, are you feeling competent this morning? I'll try it, go for it. Okay, let's see if you can spell amalgam backwards. So think of the last syllable and spell it backwards. M-A-G. Okay, middle syllable. L A M A. First, so you got it. So you just I spelled know. the whole word backwards. Now, we can't leave it backwards because that's not how we spell the word. We have to spell forward. So, Marie, could you spell it forward for us, please? 
A M A L G A M. All right, there you got it. That is a fun optional little thing that students, especially if you have students who are you know, not confident with their spelling abilities, if you lead them, if you do a little work with syllable by syllable, spell each syllable, uh, you know, mark the schwas, maybe rehearse that a tiny bit, then if they feel like they want a challenge, they can try to spell the word backwards. And you do it syllable by syllable, and they will be able to get it. And that gives them confidence that, oh, I spelled that word backwards. Um, so they can spell it forwards and backwards. And if you can spell it forward and backwards, there's a pretty good chance you're gonna be able to spell the word tomorrow um, without needing to uh, see it again. So um, that's a fun piece. And the, the students actually enjoy it and they'll, they'll wanna, let me do it, let me do it. So uh, it's just a fun way to engage them. But it is effective because to think about spelling it backwards, you really have to think about the sounds and then also picture in your brain how it was spelled when you were looking at the word. So it's making those connections a little stronger for you. Um, okay, other questions? They're coming in fast and furious. Um, oh yeah, the next one says, could you mark up the syllable types and vowels? Okay, um, we do not do that. Um, one, uh, and this, this is, I'm, I'm just gonna try to give a quick answer to that because there's a lot I could say on that. Um, this is not, really about reading the word. We're, we're learning the vocabulary for the word we're teaching. We're, we're trying to get to teaching the meaning. So we're not gonna go too far in this uh, setting the groundwork. Um, another thing is, is that actually we at Readsters, we don't teach the students syllable types. We think syllable types are great for teachers to know about. Um, and we do, when we do spelling of multi-syllable words and reading of multi-syllable words, we, um, and I skipped a step I just realized that I should have done that would make this clearer. Um, let me go back to that and model it first and then I'm gonna answer that question. Sorry, I apologize. Um, when we look at this word, I forgot to ask these questions. Um, how many vowel letters do you see in that word? And you can, you can just show me three. Three. Are they, to, second, that's first question. Second question is, are they together or apart? And you can show me together or apart, or you could show me together and apart. So they're all apart. They're apart. So mm -hmm. that, uh, do you see a silent E? No. no. Either thumbs up or thumbs down. So thumbs down. So that tells us if we have three vowels, letters, and they're not next to each other. Three syllables. You're Ice. gonna have three syllables. So we heard three syllables and I should have had you guys, I apologize. I don't know where my brain went. Should have had you guys connect the print the same way. It looks like it has three syllables. Now, if there were a vowel consonant E or a silent E here, then we would know that, say it was a, a mal game, you know, we would know that that A and that E work together to spell one vowel sound. So it's still only three syllables. And that's why we asked the silent E question. So instead of working on coding syllable types, we just go straight to find the vowels. If they're together, it's likely to be a vowel team. So that'll be one syllable. If they're apart, it's going to be uh, two syllables. And if there's a silent E, that's going to be one syllable with the, the two vowels. Um, and then we don't have to get into all the syllable types and a bunch of rules um, that may or may not be helpful. So I hope that helps answer that question. Another question. Yes. Would you teach your students about schwa? We always teach our students about schwa, yes. Um, and that, again, this is part of, we do a whole nother workshop on uh, teaching reading and spelling multi-syllable words, and it's covered in that. Um, and I think you can actually access uh, a video, maybe from Patan even, um, on that on our website at www.readsters.com, uh, and then go to links. And I believe there's a uh, recorded session on that that will show you how we teach the schwa um, I also have a lesson available. If you email me, michael at readsters.com, I can share a lesson plan uh, for teaching schwa. But yes, we do teach schwa. It's essential for reading and spelling multi-syllable words because you have to memorize the spelling for a schwa because it could be anything. Another question. Yep. How many words would you recommend for this instruction? For example, a basal user gets a ton of words per story. Yeah. I would only do this for words that you want students to really own 
beyond the text that you're working with. If it's just gonna be a word that you're using for the purposes of the given text, um, say for instance, you were reading about uh, Plains Indians and the word papoose is in there. I don't really care if my students remember to, uh, once we move on from Plains Indians, what a papoose is, because it's not a, uh, that's a tier three word. It, you know, it's just not essential. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this work to teach that word. That would be a word I'd preview. I'd show them a picture of what a papoose is, have them tell me what it is, and then get into the story. So you have to choose your words. Um, but words that are those tier two words that you really expect students to carry across content mm -hmm. uh, that you want them to own, those are the ones that you know you really want to teach, not just preview. And so those are ones that you would spend some time on. And some some you'll want to spend more time on. Some some words are not going to take much time. If if it's a simple word, uh, you can quickly, you know, say the word, repeat the word. Let's look at the spelling. Oh, the spelling's simple, but okay, we've got that match. Now we can get to the definition. But if it's a more complex word, you may want to spend a little more time on it. Next right. question. Yep, this one kind of blends in with that. How do you recommend then organizing those vocabulary words for later reference? For example, through a word wall or a journal, anchor charts, something else? Um, I think pretty much all of those are good. Um, I don't have a, a chosen way. Um, I think I like students to have some kind of written, you know, a glossary or, or a word book that they, if it's a word I really want them to own. And that's all part of what we're gonna get to next is teaching the word is, is how, how are we going to explore the meaning of the word once we've got it? Are you gonna write it in a graphic organizer? Are you gonna record it in a journal? Um, uh, those sort of things. And, and that's really more the topic of another, of how do you actually do the teaching part of the word? Um, but all, I think all of those things are great. Anybody else? One where I think you can answer this last one quick, um, fairly quickly. Do you ask struggling spellers to spell the word backwards once you have erased the word from the board? Yeah. Yes, I would if I've taught it well. So you, I, I did it kind of quickly with our students today because we have limited time. But if you're really working with with strugglers and you want them to be able to do that, um, you can do it as long as you do a little bit more rehearsal with connecting the spelling to the sound. So how many syllables were they? Okay, what's the first syllable? How do we spell that you, while they're looking? Then we take it away. We leave the lines and you spell forwards on each each syllable on the line orally and then um, you can mix it up a little bit like I did and then finally now you're ready to start with the last syllable and you may even leave the line the blank lines up there and have them spell without the word just the blank lines and have them use the those lines as a reference for last syllable what is it gum spell it backwards middle syllable what is it mal spell it backwards first syllable but you can have them do it. Um, trust me, I've I've had struggling readers spell supercalifragilisticexpialidocious backwards if you if you set it up right. My favorite word when working with second graders was hippopotamus because that's a fun word and it's long and it's quite spellable uh, forwards and backwards. Any more? No, thank you so much. Let's let's move on. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so. Now we get to teaching the meaning of the word. And here's guys where you would do um, first, and, and this is the most important to me, is you provide a definition that you have already thought about and created. And I'm gonna talk about that in a moment, but you will have a definition ready for this word because you're teaching this word and you want them to have the correct definition for it. You're gonna teach the definition and then we'll get to our step four. So I'm gonna, I, you guys are adults and teachers, so I'm gonna teach you this relatively quickly, um, but in case you didn't know the meaning of the word amalgam, I am gonna provide it. So there are two definitions I'm gonna give you because I think you guys can um, handle learning two at one time. If you were uh, younger students, I might only teach the immediate meaning for the word that they are going to be using it in the text, if it has multiple meanings. Uh, or if it's a, this word has got a very concrete meaning and then a more abstract meaning, 
And we're going to teach, I'm going to teach you both of those. But if I thought that was too much, I would teach you the concrete meaning first so that you have a base and then lay the uh, more uh, abstract meaning of the word on top of that solid base. Um, Somebody asked, do you, I just happened to see this in the, in the uh, chat and I'm gonna answer it real quickly. Do we identify the part of speech? Um, we can do that. Uh, that will also play into when we do our template that I'm gonna show you because that the templates are based on the part of speech of the word. Um, okay, so the definition of the word amalgam, the first one I'm gonna give you is that silver and mercury for tooth fillings. Uh, I don't think dentists do this anymore, but if you're of my age, uh, I still actually have um, amalgam fillings in my teeth. And they're, they're, they're kind of black looking and they're metal and it's mercury and silver combined to make an amalgam that was used to fill cavities in my mouth. Um, so I'm probably slowly dying of mercury poison, but so far I'm still with you. Um, so dentists have used uh, amalgam to fill cavities since the 1800s. I'm pretty sure nobody does it anymore. Um, okay, so that's a basic concrete thing. It's this stuff that they fill cavities uh, with that's made out of metal. Now, a more abstract meaning for amalgam and the one that our researchers were using it, uh, relies more on this is a combination of styles, characteristics, or sources. So everybody, uh, what is an amalgam? And let's give definition number two, please. A combination, combination of, of different, different styles, styles characteristics, or sources. Or sources. Yes. Okay. So um, Marie, would you read the first sentence to us, please? A number uh, it, that's two. in italics, under number two, sorry. The town itself, <laughs> strange amalgam of architectural styles with charming cottages dwarfed by 20-story postmodern office buildings and a Gothic cathedral in the middle. Awesome. So Marie, can you tell me about this amalgam that you're, you're hearing about in this sentence? Do you have a picture of what that amalgam might look like? So it's like a blend of different styles of architecture, so from modern to old to cottages, so like a, a mix. Okay, good. Um, all right, uh, Shelley, could you read the second italicized sentence? Some of us choose to honor our regional roots, others our religious roots, and others create an amalgam by merging cultures. Okay, so can you, in your own words, kind of tell me what that sentence is talking about? The sentence is talking about uh, our regional and religious roots and how some people are combining together different cultural practices to create an amal amalgam. Okay, can you think of an example that you might know of, of someone doing that? Um, a missionary going abroad and trying to learn a new culture and keep their own culture at the same time. Okay, awesome, brilliant. Uh, um, brilliant example, excuse me. Okay, um, okay, and uh, who, sorry, got that. Catherine, did you do one for us? Could you do um, number three, ancient Greek? Ancient Greece was a loose amalgam of city-states, each of which had its own form of government that occasionally banded together in war against common foes. Okay, so could describe the amalgam there. Could talk to me about what you're getting. From so uh, the amalgam there uh, could be compared to like here in the States, like Pennsylvania has its own thing. New York has its own thing. Maryland has its own thing. But when push comes to shove, everybody gets together for a common goal. Okay. Awesome. So the United States is an amalgam of states, if you will. Um, that's a great example. Okay, so our last sentence I'll read is students remember words better when they can rely on an amalgam of spelling, meaning, and pronunciation. So we have three separate things. We have spelling, we have the meaning, and the pronunciation of the word, but together 
the, they form an amalgam that provides a strong basis for uh, knowing the word, reading the word, spelling the word, and understanding the word. Okay. So that's an example of initial teaching of step three. Now, step three would continue uh, typically beyond um, your first lesson on the word if you really want students to own this word. So tomorrow we might come back and revisit uh, examples and non-examples or have students uh, use the word in, in, in a sentence that they create. Any of those activities that you want to do, and that might be when you fill out a graphic organ. You know, this is not a one day, this, this teaching the meaning of the word is not a one day step. Um, this is the first exposure where I've given you a definition, we've explored it a little bit, and now, uh, you know, we would go on with the next word and however many we're going to do today or this week, and then, um, you know, go on to other things and then come back and revisit it during the week. Step four is our wrap up activity uh, for the word. <clears throat> and this is a, the new um, piece I want to give you today. And this is, we're going to use a, a sentence stem or a, a definition from a template, I mean, a, a template for a definition um, to create our, our, in our own words, a definition for the word amalgam. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're going to do this. Amalgam is a noun, so we're going to use the noun template. And so we're going to start with an amalgam. So we've got our word is, and then we're going to decide on what's a good category or synonym for amalgam. So do, is amalgam fit into a category or what's a good synonym? Uh, something we can put in here that amalgam is, and then we're going to give characteristics that make amalgam different from some other things that might fit in the category or some other synonyms. So um, I, do I still have my five students that yes. I can call on mm -hmm. or I, if anybody mm -hmm. else wants to chime in when I call out, but um, okay. So anybody wanna offer a synonym or a category that we could fit in here to build our definition? Could you say it's a combination or a yeah. mix? Okay, combination or mix. Anybody have another one? Blend, a blend of. Okay. Blend. Well, I like blend. Right. So we took mixture or blend. I think combination works. Uh, you know, if you're um, more academic, combination works great. I think you know some of my students would be uh, happier with blend just because that's you know what they're more familiar with. But I think combination is also excellent. Okay, so now we've decided we've got a mixture or a blend. But how do what what makes it an amalgam versus some other kind of mixture or blend? Um, can anybody does would anybody like to volunteer? And if you want to type into the chat, guys, that's great too. Um, I, I'll try to scan there. Maybe connects that combines or connects different. Yeah. Okay, I see somebody wrote in the chat. Uh, whoa. It's going fast. That helps things work together. Glues uh, that combines different things into a unity. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, that's we're getting a good some. One. We're getting some great things there, and um, I love that somebody. That's a good one because this is what I would actually do with my students. Is we would get different examples from, and then we could vote uh, on which one do we agree is uh, the most the one that we you know, like the most and, and then why, or we might even get into a discussion of, well, I don't like this one because um, it doesn't quite capture something or this one seems to capture that better. So uh, have merges old and new, keeps aspects of the original. I like that keeps aspects of the original. Um, I think one of the things that I would, if I were teaching the word amalgam, I would hope that you would guys would get to is, um, I like somebody who says a mixture of different ideas that work together as one unit mm -hmm. is even in the, the amalgam that's a cavity in your, that's filling a cavity in your mouth. If you took that amalgam out and put heat to it, the mercury and the um, uh, silver would separate. So you can re-separate these things. They, they actually can still stand on their own. So if we think about the architecture. 
each building is representing an architectural style in and of itself. Together, they're forming an amalgam of styles, but they each, so they there's a, an essence to an amalgam. Uh, and if we think about it with our word, the spelling is always the spelling. The pronunciation is always the pronunciation and the meaning is always the meaning. The amalgam is the tying together of all of those things that somehow is uh, working together or is possibly even stronger than the things by themselves. I like that. Yeah. So those are the, that's, but do you see how this helps us refine and really own our definition? And, you know, if you spend a little time with this, it can be fascinating. And students will come up with some great concepts. So when we put this workshop together, we came up with as two or more different parts that work together to form a whole. But you guys had some really great ones. Uh, and there's no, you know, as long as it's getting at the meaning that that we agree is the meaning for this word and captures it. That, but can you also see how students are generating this from their own understanding of the word, they really have started to own this word. Um, so to review our four steps. The first is we're gonna cement the phonological aspects of the word in the students' minds. Then we're gonna take that pronunciation, go back to the print and connect the spelling to the pronunciation, go over any uh, odd spellings so that we can try to help start to remember those. Then we're going to provide and teach the meaning. And of course that will take longer than just one session probably. And then finally uh, we'll do our student created definition as a wrap up. Any quick questions before we, um, are we on time? Yeah, we got a little time, so we're good. I can take a couple more questions about all of that before we dive into these definitions. I, can you I go back to the slide about the, can you go back two slides to the definition? That's yeah. it, thank you. I In the back of your handouts, you're gonna have a template that has the the sentence stem that you create the definition for. I'm gonna show you that in just a second. And I think these handouts are also available. Um, this definition isn't because it's one I wanted you guys to come up with, but. I have okay. a question. Yes. In reference to when you go to step four, could you have different groups come up with different definitions of yes. different words? Uh, yes, you could, or you could have different groups work together to come up with uh, a definition for the same word and then compare uh, right. the definitions and okay, have thanks. that discussion about, well, which one do we think gets at the closest meaning? Um, you know, do we want to change ours or are we good with all of them? Um, so, thank yes. Thank you. One okay. more question just came yep. in if you would like. Sure. How do you include this in your lesson plan? Do you do this for multiple words all at one time or maybe as a bell ringer? Um, I would pick a few words that I'm going to teach for the week uh, or, or the whatever um, block of time that I'm gonna be working on the con context for these words, the text that we're working with. So I would um, choose the words that I, I most want them to carry beyond that context. Uh, my tier two words that I most want them to have. I would teach, the, I would do the introduction and the provide the definition. So steps one, two, and three uh, at one time. And then step four is going to come later after we've had some time during working on our context and our text and exploring the word deeper over some number of days uh, as the, the wrap up. And we would probably do the same, th you know, three, four words um, at that time to, uh, you know, as a session. But again, it, it, you know, it all depends on where you're doing this in, in, in what blocks, what kind of time you have and, and that sort of thing. Um, I think as a, I'm not sure that I would necessarily use this as a bell ringer, but it, I hadn't thought about that. Um, it, it could be um, as long as we go over it with the students and and make sure that we're everybody is getting to that final pretty close similar de definition okay so in the back of the handout there is this one pager that is the templates that we have for um creating these student created definitions and there are 
there's nouns and there are two uh, templates for the nouns. There are verbs um, for intransitive verbs and transitive verbs. And so an intransitive verb doesn't need an object. A transitive verb requires an object. So you're gonna have slightly different uh, template there. And then uh, the third template is for adjectives. And um, there are two templates for that. Uh, we'll try to explore all of these, but we may run a little shy of time here, but you'll at least get uh, enough to, to understand how they work. Now, the first thing before we get into using the templates is I want you to think about something that these templates also can help you as the teacher create the definition that you're going to provide for the students. And you'll use the same template. And if you use the same template to come up with a definition, then the definition the students are ultimately gonna give you is very likely gonna be close to what you gave them, which of course is what we want. We want them to get to the same definition. They may give you different examples. They may use slightly different words in their definition descriptors, but ultimately, you know, we're trying to get at the same definition. But um, you can use these templates for yourself to get ready to teach words, to come up with a clear, concise, student-friendly, as opposed to student-created, a student-friendly definition that you know your students will be able to get hold of. Um, and I find these this so powerful once you have this. Um, I was blown away when I first was shown, um, I believe it was by Louisa Motes in a letters uh, session, that you can actually have a template. This the, There's a logical way to approach the definitions for a word. And the beauty of doing this with your students is that you're creating a framework in their minds for how to create definitions. So when they start coming across words in on their own and have to come up with definitions for them, they have a framework already built into their brain that they'll plug in definitions to so that if it's a noun, it's you know, this noun is synonym or category characteristics. And it's a logical way to acquire these definitions in a systematic way that just makes it easier for students to learn them and to retain them. So you're really, part of what you're doing with this template thing is you're teaching students how to approach coming up with a definition, thinking about a definition and giving them a, a framework in their brain to, to hold definitions. But it also, if you use it, it helps you as the teacher create the definitions that the students are going to um, understand. So there, as I said, there's three template sets. There's the nouns with examples, without examples, verbs without objects, uh, verbs with objects, and adjectives. And those, you almost always need an uh, example for an adjective. So here's the first template, and this is for nouns without examples. So here it is. A, you insert A or an, the, the noun is A or an, and then category or synonym. Some words lend themselves to a category. So if I were doing um, schnauzer, a schnauzer is a, obviously the category, breed of dog or dog, type of dog. Um, that, and then I characteristics would be descriptions of what makes a schnauzer different from all those other dogs in that category. Um, and that's the way I like to think about it is that, you know, we're gonna get a synonym or a category here, and then we're gonna just get the descriptors that make it special, that word special or different from other words that fit in that category or that are synonyms. Um, then you, we also have a template where you can add some examples. I'm gonna look at one of these in a moment. Um, so you give characteristics and then you might give a familiar example, or you might give an example from the text that the students are working with for this word with so that it ties back to the text that they're working with. Here is um, a student-friendly definition that was created by uh, a fifth grade class at Clip Bly Kip Blytheville in Arkansas. Um, when this was one of the first definitions this fifth grade class created on their own after being taught about commitment, the word commitment. And they came up with a commitment is an oath or promise that you'll never give up on. And I think that's a wonderful, uh, basic, solid, secure understanding of the word commitment. 
um, and I hope you agree. So this is what we're looking for. So let's try one uh, together. And guys here, I'm gonna not call on my students. Um, I'm gonna just ask if you want to play along with this, type into the text and I'll try to um, yank out some, some examples from, from the uh, chat um, as we go. I'm gonna try to do this uh, sort of quickly because I I'm winding down on time here and I do wanna leave uh, some more time for questions, but I at least wanna give you one more chance to see how this works. So our word is immigrant. So first thing we're gonna do is, we, I'm trusting that you all know what an immigrant is. Um, we're gonna come up with a category or synonym. So we've got, uh, I'm already seeing person, person, person. Uh, human being. Okay, I think those are some great ones. Individual works too. I think all of those would work. So we have an immigrant is a person, individual, a human being. And now we're gonna talk about what do they do or why, why, what is special, what kind of special person is an immigrant? What makes them different from other persons? So we've got, um, okay, we've got leaves their home to go to another country who moves countries migrates from one country to another, comes from another country to begin a new life, has moved to a new country, person who leaves their country to find a better place, world traveler, moves from one country to another, who migrates to other areas, who moves to a new country. Okay, you guys have lots of lot, relocates from one country to another. Okay, you guys uh, obviously know something about immigrants. Um, and I think we're getting a gist here of uh, their person who leaves one country and moves to another country. Uh, and I think there's an element of an immigrant that there's an intention to stay. It's not someone who's just coming to visit. It's someone who is changing where they live. Um, I did see someone in there said something about uh, something for a better life. Um, I have been called out for that just to let to warn you that that was a value judgment that somebody was uncomfortable with i personally think that most of the time immigrants are looking for a better situation so i'm comfortable with it but just want to share that um i have been called out on that when giving this workshop okay so you guys definitely have the essence here um someone said i think less words that are impactful are more powerful i would agree we're trying to keep this you know concrete and basic for the students that this is students to generate and i think you'll find they tend to do that they're not going to be particularly um wordy about it okay um now we need our our examples and i'm just going to show up here um we put in mrs estevez for, is from spain and she teaches here um another example might be if you were reading about immigrants you could pick out, you know, some of the immigrants from the context that you, you know, were using this word in that the text you were reading. So, such as the uh, immigrants who came from um, Ireland during the potato famine, if that's what you happen to be reading about. So, there's a an example that goes back to the text that the students are learning from. Okay, let me ask for any quick questions at this point. Yes. So yes, go ahead. Um, do you do vocabulary instruction similar to this? Um, or is this day one of the unit and then review words until you start the next unit? Um, OK, day one would be the steps one, two and three. Um, day four would be before we leave the unit, probably. Or if you're going to continue the words into another unit, it, it could be then you know, done at that time if you want to give them more time to get exposure to and, and working with the word. But again, step four is the kind of, in my mind, is the wrap up for, um, not that you never come back to the word again and it's never used again, but this is, this is kind of, okay, I want to cement the work we've done with this word in this unit. Um, so for me, it would it would be kind of part of your wrap up before you move to a new unit. Um, or you might want to do it as if you're going to have this word in another unit, you might use it as a review of that word 
remember we worked on this word let's uh can you guys come together for a definition and then um you know go from there uh i love somebody i just quickly scan uh something about wonderful conversations about impact of words etc absolutely this is what i love about the coming up with the definition is this is a chance for the students to have an opportunity to talk about the meaning of the word and how and to relate it to what they know about the world um instead of you start with a definition that's your definition but they're going to bring in shades and and textures to it from their life experience and this allows for that opportunity for that to happen and and it can just open up lots of wonderful um teaching opportunities uh, as well and if you're a word nerd like me you could spend all day doing this um yes shades textures and nuances absolutely okay there is um, one more question relevant yes, to you. Go ahead. Do you have a resource that you use to find your definitions to develop your lesson plan before the students create their own? Like, do you have a particular dictionary or website? Um, yes, I have a couple in a slide coming up that that um, I'll make sure we get to. Um, they are in the handout. Um, also, these days with with uh, you know Google and whatnot, I, I hit lots of di dictionaries. Um, you, you know, it's so easy to just uh google the word and see what comes up um but there's a the collins co-build uh i think is one of the ones that's on my slide that has um that supposedly has student-friendly definitions but you have to be cautious about that um okay i've only got a few minutes left so i'm going to just flip through uh and not walk us through all of these things but here is um a verb example to trudge means to walk slowly with heavy steps because the ground is hard to walk through, the wind is blowing, you're carrying something heavy or you're tired. Now that's a long one, but those are really more examples than characteristics. Um, pummel is a transitive verb. You, you have to have uh, an object for it. So to pummel something means to hit it over and over again. Um, and then an example is often helpful. Um, Okay, to botch something means to make the mess of something you were supposed to do, so, such as botching your homework assignment or botching your lines in the play. Um, an adjective, invincible, means unbeatable, such as a boxer who is extraordinarily powerful or a chess player who is very smart and experienced. Um, okay, we don't have time to do this, but just quickly think if you if you had to define courage. Now, this is an abstract thing that's harder to do. Um, but what might we say? Courage is a anybody have an idea what category or synonym? OK. Virtue. Uh, OK, it is a virtue. It's a trait. I like that. I would go with trait or characteristic. Um, and then what what type of cake trait or characteristic is it? Um, you know, it's one of heroism, uh, bravery, uh, you know, those sort of things. And then you might give an example. But just think about if you use that template and came up with one. Now let's see what a dictionary might say. So the American Heritage Dictionary says a state or quality of mind or spirit that enables one to face danger, fear or vicissitudes with self-possession, confidence and resolution, bravery. Okay, how many of your students are going to get much out of that definition? Um, this is why we have to create student friendly definitions to give them and then help them to come to their own student friendly uh, student created definition because the dictionary often is uh, not as accessible as we would like it to be. Um, so here's the slide on, yeah, the Collins co-build and then the Longman dictionary is also uh, a good one too. Um, okay, so um, I have four minutes left and I'm going to show you this and then I can also take questions while this next little piece plays, which is a slideshow. Um, so a way for, this is a group of, um, students in a Detroit school always had trouble with the same, every time they came to this uh, unit in their um, teaching, there was the vocabulary for some reason, the kids had trouble getting hold of it. So the teacher 
developed a looping slideshow that they showed at the beginning of the day, after recess, after lunch. And they just showed it while kids were getting settled in and doing stuff, but it was there so the kids looked at it. And they were just getting this constant review of the words with the definitions. And I think you could do this with definitions that the students have created, or you could do it with your definitions. I think you could have students create the slideshow that could be a project for them. And then it could be around for the next uh, year for the next students to already be created um, and you could show it. But here's how it works. It was unit two, lesson six um, vocabulary. And it goes like this. So the word comes up, a simple definition and a picture to go along with it. Yeah, morning meetings would be good. Okay. Um, okay, I can, like I said, this can just play and you guys can be watching it and we've got a couple minutes left for questions. So um, does, uh, do one of my um, facilitators yep. wanna hit a couple of the critical ones? Yep, let me go back up. Could you demonstrate how you help kids who struggle with determining whether to use the transitive or the intransitive verb template for when they're creating student uh, created definitions? I think what I would do with that is when I give the my definition, we, it would be based on the appropriate uh, template. And I would, I would call out that this is a transitive verb or this is an intransitive verb and explain it with my definition. So they, they would know when they, uh, when they go to do their definition, they would go to the right template. Thank you. 